are in the midst of what appears to be a colossal and history-making blackout. People trapped in elevators and buildings. They have activated the emergency command center. You're staggering trying to take in as much information as you can. Mayor Bloomberg's advice is to go straight home. The subway system is down. Ottawa is completely without power now. The lightning-quick domino series of failures. You gotta go to the bathroom and you can't even go nowhere. 50 million people are thought to have lost power. In 2003, a massive blackout struck major areas of the U.S. and Canada and was perceived as a wake-up call for the nation. We've got a real crisis in our grid, and this is why, despite being a superpower, we have a grid that is comparable to a third-world country, and that's not right. But have 10 years of planning and preparation left us better off today? I don't think you can ever say with 100% confidence we won't have a blackout. Electricity is really far more important than anyone realizes. We take it for granted, we flick the switch and it goes on, but it has to be in balance or the lights go out. There has been a massive power outage throughout much of the Northeast, both of the United States and of Canada. Millions and millions of people were caught by surprise when the electrical grid suddenly crashed. It shut down a hundred power plants, from Ottawa down to Cleveland and as far east as New York. The most immediate concern was for thousands believed to be stranded underground in the dark in the New York subway system or in elevators in skyscrapers. The attacks of 9-11 were pretty fresh in everybody's mind, and the first thought on almost every New Yorker that I spoke to's mind was, is this terrorism? The police are saying that the evacuation procedures are working, people are calm, and that they are getting out. A normal August afternoon had turned to crisis. Around 50 million people across the US and Canada were left without power. All of Cleveland's water supply runs on electric pumps. My water commissioner said, the people in the Heights have water for three hours. I said, water? I thought the electric was out. He said, Mayor, how do you think the water gets from the lake to the people in the Heights? You can get along in the dark, you can get along in the heat, but uh, water becomes a health and safety issue very quickly. While terrorism was soon ruled out, there was a frenzied search to unravel the mystery behind the source of the blackout. We don't know yet what went wrong. But we will. What we're hearing on the uh, radios is that there was some sort of incident in Ontario, Canada. There was a lot of finger pointing. U.S. officials initially accused a mishap at a Canadian utility plant. The mayor of Toronto fired back. Tell me, have you ever seen the United States take blame for anything? It took 29 hours for the power to be turned back on in most major cities. But the brief outage contributed to at least 11 deaths and cost an estimated $6 billion in economic losses. We were fortunate that the grid stayed up as it did and it didn't continue cascading any further. Engineers spent months unraveling the cause of the blackout and traced it not to New York or Canada, but to a downed power line in Ohio. The theory was it was a tree in suburban Cleveland. And we were like, what? The official report later found it was a series of human and operational failures that set the blackout in motion. A downed power line went unnoticed because the alarm system failed at the local power company, First Energy, and soon other lines were overloaded. When the line overheated, it sagged. And as it sagged, it hit a tree that shouldn't have been in the right-of-way corridor. Meanwhile, at the regional service operator, Midwest ISO, an employee had gone to lunch and forgot to turn back on the tool that monitored grid problems. As the grid in Ohio got less and less stable, with too much voltage over too few lines, power plants began to turn off. And eventually it cascaded around the Lake Erie Loop and all the way to New York. Investigators said today this nation's worst power blackout was mostly the fault of the First Energy Corporation of Akron, Ohio. First Energy was busy trying to grow, trying to absorb other companies. 
and the report found that they had let many basic things go. That included tree trimming under these power lines. Their computers hadn't been upgraded. But it was more than that. First Energy declined to speak with us, but as publicly said, it implemented new safeguards. Many saw the blackout as emblematic of a wider problem, one brought about by a lack of government oversight for years in the electric industry. The standards are voluntary and not enforceable. It's like expecting your kids when you walk out of the room and leave a pile of candy not to help themselves, uh, unless you've said there will be consequences if you grab that pile of candy. First Energy was never fined for its role in the blackout. In 2005, Brownell's agency, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, was finally given the power to impose hefty fines and has levied tens of millions of dollars in penalties since 2010. But fundamental issues remain. It still doesn't quite make sense to me that the grid was that vulnerable. It's a big old system when it started. You had a little local system. You had an electric power provider, a plant, a spider web of wires around the plant to serve customers near the plant. Then you put together a national system where you connect all those spider webs. It's grown up over a long period of time, and there just isn't one center or one organization or one entity that's in control of the whole system. There have been improvements since the blackout, including those that allow power companies to better monitor usage. The goal is to use that information to redirect power across the nation's grid in real time to stop blackouts before they start. At some point, there may be a breakthrough where it becomes very efficient and effective to store energy in that you'll be able to shift energy uses to different parts of the day as one grid, as one system. And I think that will dramatically change how this industry is operated. We have perhaps a trillion dollars that needs to be invested in the electric grid to bring it up to the speed we want it to be to serve the needs of this country. We're really living on our great-grandparents willing to spend money on roads, on bridges, on electric transmission lines. We haven't done that in a long time, and we have to get real about that. Massive blackouts continue to be a global problem. 15 million people lost power in Europe in 2006, 60 million in Brazil and Paraguay in 2009, and more than half a billion in India in 2012. Such events have fueled the imagination of TV writers, who have added their own twist. It's going to turn off, and it will never, ever turn back on. This may be fiction, but former Senator Dorgan who worked for years on congressional energy committees and recently wrote a novel speculating about a terrorist attack on the power grid, says the threat today is bigger than a few downed power lines. We know from lots of anecdotal examples that the terrorists that use cyber terror uh, are very inventive. They know that if they could bring down an electric power grid system, uh, that would cause really maximum damage. This is a big, big challenge for our country. The collective result of these kinds of attacks could be a cyber Pearl Harbor. This week, more than 200 private and public energy companies will stage a large-scale mock blackout. No lights will go out, but the drill will test how government and utility workers would react if the grid went down. If you bring down the electric power grid system in this country and it stays down for any length of time at all, it'll wreck the American economy. So we've got a lot at stake, and we better, we better keep our eye on the ball. 